in which the, the profession was feeling infantilized by uh, the sort of over-specialization and an extraordinary risk-averse environment. And architecture itself was be being perceived as a risk. So to the extent that you, say, you, you could say that you would make a building more beautiful uh, by making it more architectural, that was looking like uh, a, a risk. And it was tended to be sliced off by value engineering, which it, it generally was a, a technique for removing the architect. Uh, not from the contract per se, but just from having any, any real uh, uh, control. So the idea here was that was to actually uh, 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 kind of return the architect to a sort of adult position. And Shop went one step further, which is to say, if, if we understood that so well, then we'd rather have a piece of the action than be off to one side. And I think in some of the early projects, when they themselves were a pretty risky bunch, they basically said to the people that they were working with, developers and so on, Look, uh, we, we, we so believe in our ideas that we don't want to fee, but we're gonna, we want to take a piece of what of the success of the project. And I think this, this of course, uh, uh, led to terrific collaborations between Sharp and, and a wide variety. Uh, uh, and and, and that's, that's gone from a few smaller buildings uh, deeper and deeper into the heart of the world of New York construction, which is not a place for the faint-hearted to uh, uh, operate in. Projects are getting bigger and bigger. Um, it's really like one of those science fiction movies where shop projects go bloop, bloop, and if you look away from the screen, it's like bigger and bigger. Um, uh, interestingly, they're also able to operate where the big fish fail, and there's now a pretty strong track record of extraordinarily famous architects that were trying to do something, uh, couldn't get it done, and then shop walked in and did it. Um, and this says something about generations and uh, 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 expertise. Um, you can you can think who these big fish are. Actually, they they like fish. Uh, these these fish. Um, the, Bar the 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 Barclays Center is 675 uh, million budget, I think. So it's well on the way towards uh, uh, the billion mark. Um, but you've got to know that the Barclays Center is just the tip of the iceberg. It was described by New York Magazine, I think, last year as the number one reason to love New York in 2012. I mean, that is so uh, over the top as a, uh, how do you recover from that? Um, uh, it's interesting, of course, that something in Brooklyn is now the number one reason to love New York. So it really, it really also speaks about the changing world and the changing city. But probably, as you will learn tonight, the Barclays Center is actually the tip of a much bigger iceberg that Shop is working on with the same uh, people and, and, and also the kind of thinking about prefabricated office towers and so on. And that's going to push way over the billion uh, mark. So those little arguments inside the school about how you could reposition the architect in relationship to computation is really now about repositioning architectural expertise in the one billion plus uh, 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 environment. And of course, what's so interesting about shop work is that it sets a very clear pattern or a model for other architects to follow. So it's really a kind of a viral uh, um, source of, uh, um, uh, of knowledge. And not by chance the work becomes, I think, more and more global with projects in, in Africa and China and, and so on. So, so really, shop has become an extraordinarily dangerous uh, 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 animal. And interestingly, of course, within all of this, there is a kind of, I think that you can pretty much tell what's a shop project and what's not. So within all of this, they haven't act actually sacrificed any of what would be normally understood to be the sort of artist's signature, even if art is not really the thing that they push. The way they play around with the relationship between the money and the object has a certain feel to it. And I think you'll learn tonight that that's the shop uh, 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 operation. So basically what I'm trying to say in a long-winded way is that it's super nice to welcome uh, Greg back to the school, school in which he was for so long a fa fabulous teacher, true of all of the group actually, Shop are also all like super talented teachers. But it's a great confirmation moment, especially at the beginning of the semester, that that the crazier you are inside this place, more, it's quite possible the bigger your impact will be uh, uh, outside. Seemingly small, impossible to believe experiments within the school have led to super radical transformations, not just in New York City, but I think in the, in the kind of positioning of the architect. Very, very likely there's going to be another wave that, that will build upon what Shop has done that will go even deeper uh, uh, into the sort of logic of the spreadsheet and so on. And, and it, once again, uh, reposition the, 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 uh, uh, the architect. As you probably know, architecture has often operated in uh, Western society as an image of kind of risk aversion, of stability, confidence, st and, and so on. Uh, so it's very, very interesting to me that when the architect regains a position of authority 
within the workflow of the production of buildings, there will be new ways in which architects can, as it were, uh, reassure society that things are going to be okay. So amazingly enough, these absolutely crazy people uh, are now going to be in a position to reassure society that things are just going to be okay. Uh, Greg. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, very much. It's, uh, it's really always amazing to come back in this room thinking about, uh, you know, which seat I slept through structures class in over in the corner there. But um, it's, it's, this is, I think, the third or fourth time I've given the public lecture here. And um, it's, it's always, uh, I have an amazing feeling to be here. I have incredible respect for this institution. It's what made us who we are as architects. It's what brought us together. And um, it's, it's very special for us to be here. Um, thanks, Mark, for the very kind um, and insightful way of talking about our work. Um, I think you're doing an amazing job in, in curating and keeping this place evolving and, and really almost reinventing what, a, what an architecture school could be. Um, I'd also like to thank my, uh, my partner, Vishan Chakrabarty. Um, so after 10 years of working together in, in all different ways, we're, you know, we're glad that you're finally home at our office. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's been an interesting ride. I mean, you know, it was 20 years ago I was sitting there and, and watching different things happen in this room. I, I was thinking about all the lectures I saw. I mean, I remember uh, a lecture when Rem Coolhouse was probably in his 40s, was not yet, you know, sort of Rem as we all know him now, and was sitting here in the, in the, in the recession in like 1990 and talking about all the projects that didn't get built, you know, and, he was he was saying you know one out of ten of my designs did you know got built that's it and I was sitting there and as a student seeing like oh my god this guy's like the most unlucky person in the entire world how could only one <laughs> this guy's a genius and only one out of ten buildings got built and what I can tell you now twenty years later is that he was the luckiest guy in the world that he got one out of ten buildings built. <laughs> um, I also remember an amazing night where. Um, uh, uh, Tom Main and uh, Kenneth Frampton almost came to blows uh, right here <laughs> and we just sat in, sh in shock. It was awesome. It was great. And you know, it was also, and it was Tom talking about the recession and about how hard it is to keep a firm going, how hard it is to keep the vision and to push forward. And, and there have been so many times, these are just some examples, but there have been so many times that what I heard as a student in this room has been the thing that's kept us going and, and kept us trying to push what we believe architecture can be. And um, we believe tremendously in architecture and the effects and the ways that it can affect and change a city and change the way that we, we, we think and live and interact. And so um, while I think that for a while there, people were sort of getting a little bit down on architecture and frustrated with where the profession was going, we believe quite the opposite. And so tonight I'd like to just talk to you about how we, how we made that transition and some of the things that we've done over the years um, <clears throat> to get to a place like Barclays. Um, I will start just because, uh, you know, we were, we were Columbia grads and, you know, the original name of the firm came from our last names, but that was taken off a long time ago because we didn't believe that it was about any of us as individuals. Um, but, but just so that people sort of know, um, uh, basically we were all in the, the four of us were in the class of 1994 and Chris was in the class of 1990 here at GSAP and, um, uh, Bill and Chris are identical twin brothers and the firm really started in, um, the fall semester of second year, which I guess you all just survived, um, as housing partners. And, um, we had, it was this kind of bizarre semester because um, a thousand plateaus had been published that semester, and we started reading it, and you know, like we almost, we it almost killed us. You know, I think I think we threw out our housing project seven times that semester trying to figure out what striated and smooth space was, and it was amazing. And at the end of the semester, we ended up with a with a, a pretty good project. And at the end of the semester, Bill and I shook hands and we said. Like, you know, you're a great guy and everything else. The one thing we know is you and I should never practice together. <laughs> so. Um, so a few years later, uh, the five of us came together and, and founded SHOP. Um, and uh, also a couple of us got married. 
uh, in here. So along the way, so you know, if you're in these boxes, you're married and you share stuff like um, you know bank accounts and things like that. And if you're in the blue the blue circle, you know, you share things like genetic code. So, um, but you know, it's it's amazing. I, I remember um, Peter Eisenman, like, he came over when we first started and he looked at us and he's like, this is never going to work. <laughs> he was like, I give you a year, Max, before the, before the five of you kill each other. And um, I mean, I'd have to say that one of the, one of the great things is the, is the incredible friendship and trust. And it started by being in the studios at Avery together, you know, into, late into the night all the time. Um, the firm grew. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things about the five of us is that none of the five of us studied architecture as undergrads. And not that that's so important, but I do think it allowed us to sort of freely adapt other methods of problem solving and try to bring those, those ideas to architecture. And I think that we, even in, in our hiring of, of, of the people who were at SHOP, try to look for as uh, sort of broad discipline and, and, and sort of ideas as possible. Um, in 2007, from all of the kind of research that came out of the office, uh, we decided to start shop construction. And John Malley, also a Columbia graduate, um, and who was really our first full-time employee, um, uh, became a partner and, and runs that company. And, um, and then very happily, very happily, I found my twin uh, with Vishan uh, arriving at the office uh, this year, even though, as I said, we've work together in lots of different ways over, over a greater part of a decade. Um, you know, this is our sort of summary of architectural, you know, the practice of architecture for the last sort of hundred years. And, you know, I think that one of the things that sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say frustrated us, but we saw it as a kind of challenge was this sort of split between, you know, architects that can win great competitions, can drive art, can think and really push push uh, ideas, and then architects that, you know, actually can build a building and detail it and it doesn't work. And it was very sort of challenging to us why there was such a split. And I think that while the five of us came together because we liked each other, genuinely, um, I think that we came together really out of this idea that maybe we don't have to split. Maybe there's really a way of thinking about both of these things can reinforce each other and that the more that you know about the technology or the finance or the politics or whatever those issues are, maybe that's a driver for the art. Uh, I think sort of very much uh, like what Mark had said in his introduction. I think as we started to practice, we, we looked at this. This is, I believe, the only drawing in the um, AIA documents. And uh, we unequivocally believe that this is the single worst architectural drawing in the history of mankind that this is not a drawing about how to really get things done. This is a drawing that's made by lawyers who want to ensure that they have business for the rest of their careers. This is a drawing that sets up a kind of animosity and a, and a, 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 a difficultness with trying to push forward how we can think about building and design and the kinds of effects that they have. And so I think that the way we tried to think about the office was that each one of these things could, could come together in a way that reinforces the other. And that you could both be a guardian of culture and, a, and someone who can execute a building at the highest level. Um, I think that also in that sort of broad thinking about, about our office, we have a lot of really wonderful smart people in, pe in, the, in the firm and they like to think about lots of different things. And so we kept thinking about the territories that architects practice in. And, you know, the AIA has kind of constantly, especially in the last 20 or 30 years, it's all about not taking sort of avoiding risk and, and, and trying to sort of limit, uh, you know, like uh, limit your exposure as much as possible. Well, you know, what, what we think about architects and architecture is that we're not really specialists. That's not really what we believe we're good at. We believe that architects are incredible generalists that what we know is so broad about so many different things that why would we want to sort of force ourselves into just making the image of a building? And that the more and more you get into what, what we call the thickness, and, and it starts with the things, like I said, you know, politics and, and, and technology and finance and, and, and those, those elements, but, but then also, you know, just pushing more and more into how the buildings get made, how they're executed, what the different kinds of effects and causes and ways in which they work in their, 
you know, in their environment, that sort of broadness, I think, really empowers you to push the aesthetics and push the design. So we, we started doing things, we had the construction, we took uh, equity positions in some of our buildings, we were obviously a design firm, we're trying to launch uh, a software company that's developing sort of next generation kinds of software for architecture, architecture and development. We've been working on a, a product that's a, um, a, a sort of uh, uh, sustainability technology and um, you know, other, other ideas. And it's, it's this kind of free and open system that allows people to sort of use their skills and, and try and grab back these territories that we've systematically given away over the previous years. So, you know, we think about as the computers were finally sort of getting fast enough and they were this idea of the relationship between form and performance and materiality um, was kind of developing, you know, a lot of complex forms were, you know, sort of developing in the office. And we just started thinking about, well, how uh, historically did they break these things apart? How did they build them? How did they make them? What was the history of the relationship between new materials, new technology? new aesthetics, how these things would go together, and, and, and looked at it in nature, looked at it in aerospace. And, and the more and more that we started to look sort of into these elements for our inspiration, the more and more we were trying to draw this stuff and we realized that the sort of standard convention of plan, section, and elevation was becoming less and less important to us. That the way that we had, we had to start to think about new kinds of drawings that were really about about how materials were made, how they were delivered, how they were assembled, and it was more about sort of time and presence and fabrication than it was about this kind of system of looking at the building outside. And the more and more that we got into that, the more we understood about construction, and the more we understood about construction and we understood the financial side of it, the less likely the clients were, or the construction managers were able to value engineer the work. So the, the deeper we got, the more control we kept and it's something that we keep trying to do uh, today. And so if you go way back to some of the first projects like um, uh, our PS1 from, from 2000 that we did, and it was really about thinking about a new kind of drawing and a new way of, of building uh, an object. You know, we, we had this kind of form and how did we pull it out and in three, we only had three weeks to design it and three weeks to build it. Um, they weren't quite as organized back then. And you know, to really kind of rethink the, the kinds of drawings that we made, this, this notion of sort of embedding into the surface of the building, both the program, the structure, um, and the surface kind of becoming this one thickness, thinking about the kinds of drawings that need to be made so that you could build something highly complex in a very simple and straightforward way. And, and this idea of thickness is something that still rings through all of the, all of the projects, as, or many of the projects, not every single one. Um, but but moving, it, moving it even further in some of our first built work, like our park out in Greenport, and, and starting to think about buildings where an entire building was both designed as a performance envelope and then, and then uh, uh, constructed using CNC technology. I mean, you know, in the, in the late 90s, and we were telling people, like, you could use a computer to make a facade. I mean, they thought we were nuts. Ten years later, it's almost standard practice now that everyone is thinking about this stuff. And so it, it's, it's exciting for us to see that it's come to fruition, but what's next and what's the next position for, for where architects need to be? Um, we started building overseas and thinking about how to, you know, a lot of the way that we got our buildings built was by sort of really rolling up our sleeves and being involved and on the site all the time. But how do we now have to start making drawings when we would build something 7,000 miles away and it would, it would get executed and we couldn't be there, you know, sort of babysitting the process all the way through? Um, to then starting to win sort of larger competitions. This was for a building that we designed for FIT and, and thinking about the notion of performance relative to a, a, a facade system that actually changed the way the school would operate as a, as a design school. Um, but then I think that a really critical project came with a building called the Porter House that we did down on 15th Street. And, and this was the first time that we, you know, we kept seeing that as we were working, we were using all this knowledge and it was completely benefiting the clients, you know, and, and our fee wouldn't change. So we finally said to ourselves, well, why can't we take that risk along with the client? Why can't we, if our building, we'll put our fee at risk and if our building is successful, we should, we should succeed, you know, and without that kind of equity stake, 
it, it seemed really silly for us to just sell ideas by the hour. Now, you know, it's very funny. I, re I remember being at this uh, podium. It was a different one then. It was a little bit smaller. But, um, and I was talking about this project when we were thinking about it. And a lot of the faculty were, you know, after the lecture came up and when I said we were going to join venture and become one of the owners of the building. And, you know, a lot of the faculty came up and said, you know, are you sure you want to do that? You know, it's a slippery slope to hell. You're in bed with the, de with the developers. Like, you know, you're going to lose your street cred. You know, there was a lot of concern. Um, and I will say it was, it was Bernard uh, Chumi who said, don't worry about it. And you should, you should have the, the guts to go, to go after it and see if you can make it work. So the project was very simply a six story uh, turn of the century uh, warehouse building. And there were two shorter buildings uh, to the south. All the FAR was used because it was a six FAR building. We bought the air rights from next door. There was a height limit and a setback requirement. And now this is something that's done quite often, but at that time it really wasn't done very much where we started, we bought the air and light easement over the buildings to the south. And in order to sort of beat out the other guys who were sort of, who were chasing the, the original building, we had to make the building as big as we possibly could so that there would be theoretically more revenue stream on the back end that would allow us to bid a little bit more for the original building. And working with uh, Bureau Happold, um, you know, we really came up with a very clever way of, of making a sort of two-story couple and putting um, half of the, the, the uh, foundations in compression and half of them in tension with uh, a new core that keeps the building from rotating over. And we were able to get that cantilever out for almost a nominal cost. And just by pushing it and getting that extra square footage, it gave us a little bit more projected revenue and allowed us to, to sort of get control of the site. So, you know, the idea then was to, to you sort of had a six-story masonry building and a six-story steel and glass building that were connected by a two-story couple to make a 10-story building in total. And then the idea of the facade was just, again, an exploration of materiality, where we said, well, we've never done a building out of metal. What could we do with metal? And, and that our idea for contextuality is that it should look nothing like the building that it's sitting next to at all. So how do you push that idea as much as you can? And we went to, we went to um, facade manufacturers. And we, we also we wanted to use a natural material. It's always something that's important to us is really try not to have very finished material. So zinc was just what we figured we would try. And we went with the drawings. And you know, they basically said, well, a zinc, a zinc uh, facade is going to cost 50% more than a regular steel facade. And you know, I said, well, zinc only cost about 10% more as a material, and, and your material is only half of the whole cost of putting something together, why would it be 50% more? And they said, well, that's it. It's 50% more. We don't want to do it, so we're just going to charge you through the nose if you want a fancy zinc building. So what we said, and we asked them and said, like, so where does the zinc come from? And they said, well, most of it comes from France. And so we actually got on a plane and went to France and bought a 1,000 sheets of zinc and brought it back to New York. And we had one meter by three meter sheets of zinc. And uh, we decided to then take those single panels and design the building from the raw material, where you had sort of one panel unfolded on the one by three meter, two panels, three panels. Eventually, there were about 22 protoforms, about 400 unique shapes of zinc, and about 4,000 pieces in total. So instead of doing uh, 400 shop drawings for all this, very, it was going to be a rain screen system. So we learned how you make a rain screen. And we did all the sort of three-dimensional models to show all the kind of ways in which it folds and comes together. But it was the first time that we went to SolidWorks and uh, loaded all the differences and all the drawings into a table. And it went directly um, uh, from this to the, to the laser cutter to cut, the, to cut all of the 4,000 panels. Every panel then had a code system on it, which became the sort of instruction set for how the pieces would be, how the pieces would be made, where they would be laid out, and where they would go on the building. And so the instruction set for the building itself becomes the architectural detail that still sits uh, on the facade today. So the 4,000 pieces were brought in. We started at one corner. And we went all the way around to the, the corner again where the 4,000 pieces were up. And we were off by 1 32nd of an inch with zero shop drawings. 
and we said, okay, this is, this is good. So um, uh, the other thing is at the time, like a, a typical brick cavity wall, you know, like your typical punched window with a, um, a PTAC unit was about $50 a square foot. Like a nice metal facade was about $70 a square foot. The Richard Meyer buildings in the village had just gone, uh, Perry Street had just gone up that year. That, that facade was about $110 a square foot. We delivered this facade for $43 a foot just by taking the complete risk of doing it ourselves and figuring out how to, how to use the material, how to push the architecture, and how to take, take control by grabbing these territories that someone else, um, you know, that had been sort of given away over time. So the interesting thing is t it's now 10 years old, this building, and, uh, and there's never been a leak in this part. There's been a leak in the old part, but, but never in the new part. So it, it worked. We were very lucky. Um, but anyway, you could see the building. I think one of the things that, that we really wanted to do here was kind of push the facade in and out by setting the glass back 14 inches. So it, it gives a lot of sort of shadow play. And, you know, there are 300 and something windows on this, on the kind of contemporary box on the top. And so by pushing them in, of course, suddenly you have a, uh, an issue because you have ledges. And in New York, we have a pigeon problem. And so we um, called the Museum of Natural History and we asked them, is there an angle of repose that a pigeon would not like to sit on? And they said, in fact, there is. It's 34 degrees. And so every, every window has a, a panel in it that's, it's, by the way, it's, it's labeled PS and then it's code number, which stands for pigeon slide. And, um, and it's remarkable because uh, you, you're in the building and sometimes the pigeons land and, and they go right off the edge. <laughs> And, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly proud because uh, 10 years later and there's not a single turd on the entire facade. <laughs> so, um, you know, we did the collateral materials, we did the interiors, we brought it to market, the building lights up at night, and, you know, it was, it was a tremendous success. And, and, you know, it really taught us something that, in fact, the exact opposite happened than what we thought was going to happen, that it wasn't that we, because we were in bed with the developer, so to say, that we lost our ability to design. In fact, once everyone knew, the bankers and everyone knew that we were at risk with them, we actually got much, much more design freedom. Because they didn't think that our whole objective was to spend as much money as possible to sort of build an edifice to ourselves. They assumed that we were going to, because we were at risk with them and our, our, our goals were aligned, that the decisions we were going to make were going to be to benefit everybody. And so the more and more that we engage in that way, the more and more we find that we get design freedom. Um, so the success of that project led us to um, starting, this was the original plan for the South Street Seaport with a 495 foot tower uh, in a historic district that has a maximum height of 120 feet. Um, that was a, a fascinating project that we went through. Um, we sort of got about halfway through landmarks when the crash hit. Uh, we are now working uh, for the successor owner of the site on developing a new plan um, uh, for the South Street Seaport. Um, we won a competition to do a two-mile esplanade uh, down in, in Lower Manhattan, sort of under the FDR Drive. The first section opened about a year ago. Um, it's eventually going to be five different sections that get built over the next four years. Um, one of my favorite uh, features in this, in this project are... Um, you know, when, um, my pet peeve when you go to a waterfront park is you, you sit on the chair and then the 42 inch rail is exactly where your eyes are to go look out at the water. So it was a five year battle with the, uh, with the city of New York to have bar stools um, all, along the, uh, all along the esplanade and you can see that the rail moves in and out and becomes these sort of tables and you sit up there and you can look out. They're, they're uh, the most popular seats in the, uh, in the park itself. Um, to our, our park pier, uh, Pier 15, that opened last year. It's a double-decker pier so that you can maximize the amount of outdoor space and recreation space without uh, increasing the amount of shading on the river bottom, bottom for environmental purposes. It's sort of held up by these glass boxes with, uh, with lawns on the top with green roofs. Um, to a building that uh, we designed, we, we won... Uh, an international search of 400 firms to do uh, Google's first ground up building in Mountain View, California. It was an amazing experiment where they really pushed us at every level to see you know, what was possible to do in, in, uh, 
in, in sort of contemporary corporate design. And, and the whole building is really a kind of giant performance envelope um, and, and a kind of armature, if you will, for emerging technologies. Um, this was unfortunately another building that kind of died in, in the crash of 2008-9. Uh, we did another building for them, an, an interior spit out, which we're never allowed to publish, talk about, or show, um, but it's really cool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, to, to then, you know, having worked with the city and worked with clients like this, we, we did some work for Goldman Sachs, also another project we're never allowed to publish. And, uh, and doing work for the mayor, and then the mayor put us on a short list to do uh, the new Bloomberg building in London. Uh, it was a, you know, and, and we saw that our, you know, when we were when we were a younger office, you know, if you, if you can win like sort of one or two competitions out of every ten you enter, you're in you're in pretty good shape. And sort of in our our first incarnation, we we had a, a, an amazing run. I think we won eight out of thirteen, and that really is what kind of launched launched the firm. As we've moved on now, like the very exciting news is, is now we're very much up against, you know, the Pritzker winners and the, the, the biggest talents in, the, in, in our industry. Um, the bad news is our winning percentage has gone way the hell down, but that's okay. Um, so this one, we got to the final two and, and lost it to Norman Foster. Um, but it was a, a really interesting project about, about the way there'd be a kind of connection, you know, for a media company, both in London and New York, connection to the street and the way that it, it, it sort of um, held its position in its environment uh, of the city. Um, to some of our new work, this is a new project that's going to be, that's uh, under construction in Kenya. Um, so again, it's taking the whole sort of performance uh, diagrams of the way in which the local trees work and using that as, um, it's, it's basically the, the first building of a three million square foot technology center um, um, in Kenya to another competition that we won. Fortunately, this time we were able to beat Mr. Foster. And um, this is in Botswana. This is a government complex outside the capital of, of uh, Gaborone. Um, we used a lot of the ideas that we had developed in, in Google and uh, applied them to the climate in Africa. And it was really fascinating how the dynamic models change the actual morphology of the building based on uh, the localized climate issues. Um, my favorite part is that we leave the beautiful trees on the site, the parking goes underneath, it's all sort of um, burned up, and then the shade, these become these kind of shading devices uh, through the courtyards, and you move between the different elements in the building through these glass bridges uh, through the, through the treetops. Um, here you can see sort of what it would be like in the, in the uh, office spaces, looking out. Um, to a project that I'm not supposed to show, so I'm not going to tell you where it is or what it is, but it's, uh, it's a, a new stadium um, and that we're sort of should be announced sometime in the next couple months. Uh, you know, it's it, one of the things that's really funny about architecture is like you are so unfairly uh, unqualified for something until you've done one of that type, right? So it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Like, have you done a 10-story condominium? Yes, okay, you can do it. Have you done a 15-story rental? No, well, you can't do it. It's five more pages in the set, man. It's like no different, right? But now, but then the, the, the corollary to it, though, is uh, uh, once you've done one of a type, you're now unfairly overqualified to do as many of them as you want. So uh, suddenly we're stadium architects, you know, we got, because we got Barclays done. So. Uh, it's kind of interesting. So this is uh, a pretty interesting project where the park actually folds up into the concourse and it's all about making a, a, a new kind of stadium that has no walls, that's completely open at, at all times. And uh, don't notice what city that is on the right hand side. And you can see as it comes oh, in, where the ices are, <laughs> <laughs> are from. Um, and. Uh, you can see the whole idea is that the sort of upper deck folds down. This becomes the kind of public space and um, some fantasy sculptural object out there sort of enters the stadium, becomes part of the branding of it it's, uh, in and of itself. But then this brings us to uh, the corner of Atlantic Avenue and Flatbush. And, you know, um, there was obviously a lot of issues uh, with this project um, all the way through. It was highly controversial, eminent domain. But at the same time, you've got 11 subway lines and a train line. And you know, this is, 
if we want to make a more sustainable city, it's not about like hanging more photovoltaics off facades. It's about putting density where transportation is. That's the best thing that we can do. And so in our, in our opinion, this was always a smart idea for this site. Um, this was the this was the Geary plan um, and and a very interesting and brilliant plan in our opinion and one of the things that we felt was was most interesting about it was that literally it, it, the, the design was four towers with very large foundations that basically held the bowl in the middle and so most of the arena that's really there's one side here and one side here you can't see the arena sort of goes through these buildings itself erroneously or maybe maybe not erroneous, it's kind of the way it's always described was that they couldn't afford the Geary arena and what it what it really was the, the price of the arena was the same if not maybe even more the issue was that in 2009 when this was starting they couldn't finance the four towers there was no mechanism to get those built so the building then had to be completely redesigned and this is uh, I think in March or April of 2009 so um, uh, our client asked uh, Mr. Geary to redesign it, but obviously it would take you know 12 to 18 months at a minimum to start. And the issue was that the um, tax laws were changing, so that stadium um, uh, tax bond financing was no longer tax deductible if your building hadn't started by December 31st, 2009. So if they didn't get the building going, there would be a hundreds of millions of dollar hit to the project and probably would have killed it. So the, what happened then was that they went to um, who I believe are the best design build um, contractors in the United States, Hunt Construction, and they said, how could we have a stadium under an arena, I'm sorry, an arena underway in eight months from now? And they said, the only way you can do that is we have to pick a stadium that we've already built so that we have the drawings so we can order the steel immediately so that we could get it in the ground by the end of the year. So they went around to a lot of the different stadiums that they built and they, the one that fit and that they liked the most was um, Conseco Fieldhouse in Indianapolis. And so they took that design, and Ellerby Beckett were the architects, so Ellerby Beckett was brought on and they were told, drop that stadium right in Brooklyn and let's go. Well, that's what caused, so this is, this is the view of that stadium there. There's one more here. And um, uh, you know, that caused a, a bit of an, a, an, a, a crisis, if you will, and, and a sort of scandal that kind of hit the front pages of the New York Times. And so the issue was that um, you know, we, we then were approached um, uh, by by Bruce Ratner in Forest City, and they said, could you take this building and fix it? Is there something you could do to take this thing and change it? So, you know, I, it was really a very tough thing for Ellerby Beckett, and who then got bought out by AECOM. So, and I have a lot of respect for those guys and their, their excellent people and everything else, but it was really tough, because they were sort of told to do one thing, and then at the last second, everything changed. So it was, um, it was a tricky thing, and, and quite frankly, we, we had some meetings with, with um, with Bruce and, and his team and we turned the project down um, because really what it seemed like to us was that they wanted us to just do a kind of skin job on the building, you know, just make a new facade. And we said that, you know, we don't really do that. We had great, we had great meetings and it was, it was all good and, and, but you know, it just didn't seem like it was gonna be the right fit. And Bruce said, you guys are terrific, you know, I'll call you when the recession's over, you know, and like that was it. And we, we shook hands and walked away. Well. Then we, we sort of went out, we started thinking about, well, maybe there's a way that we could think about it where we would go inside and begin to pick and pull and take the building apart. And by the end, even though the steel's already been ordered, we can really radically change what the building is. So, you know, we sort of had this box, if you will, and we started thinking about Brooklyn, like the kind of industrial nature of it, the sort of, uh, you know, the iconic nature, the kind of mixture of the, you know, cobbles and, and, and steel. Uh, the Brooklyn night just kept being something that we thought about, like the sort of wet streets on the, on the, on the, in the city and, and the way that it feels. Um, I don't think I've ever shown this. This is, this is actually the first sketch that we did um, when, we, when we were sitting around trying to think of what to do. Um, the one thing that none of us who were all sitting, the, the partners were all sitting there while we were drawing this, no one knows why Toyo Ito's name is on this drawing. <laughs> 
I still, I still have no idea. So, can it, does anything look like Toyo Ito? I don't think so. So anyway, um, uh, and, and so the idea was to completely change the orientation of the building. We started thinking about these sort of horizontal bands. And, and one of the things about, a, about an arena is that it, you know, it's solid and it's, it, it, it turns its back on the neighborhood. And so we felt like if we could lift up the bottom of it and make it as transparent as possible and even turn the retail not into the concourse but out to the street and we could break it up into these um, patterns of, of sort of solid, you know, like uh, uh, void, solid, void, solid, that it would begin to have a new kind of relationship with its context that this is sort of the datum of the five-story brownstone neighborhood. This halo becomes kind of like something that's seen on the urban scale and that at very localized conditions when you're walking on the street, you could change the way in which um, um, you interact with the building. One of the great things and one of my favorite parts is that we really talked about opening up a giant sort of uh, slot into the building so that when you're the, since the court is sunk below street level, when you're actually outside on the plaza, you can look right into the building and see the bowl and see the, the scoreboard. So it, it begins this kind of inside-outside relationship that I find to be very interesting and that we're very excited about. And then we felt that there needed to be some kind of gesture at the front end. And so it was this idea of a large kind of canopy element that we cut a hole in because we didn't want it to feel sort of dark and oppressive when you were there, um, which became the, the, the Oculus. And, and this idea of the way you sort of interact with it and look to the sky and see the upper halo as you, as you move in and out of the building. Um, so this is an other drawing I've never shown. This is, so we, we, called, we called Bruce back and we said, we have an idea and that might work. And we said, um, give us three days, we'll send you one drawing. If you like it, you call us back and we'll, 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 we'll work on it. And if you don't, no harm, no foul. We'll, we'll talk to you in a couple of years. So that's the drawing we sent to him. Um, that's three days after the little Toyo Ito unknown sketch. Um, and what I find interesting is these next two slides. So that's day three. That's when we finished the construction drawings uh, only seven months later. And that's the building as it got built. And I think it's kind of remarkable that going through three and a half years untold ability of thinking about how to value engineer, how to get this built, how to push the technologies, the, 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 the complex curvature and the, the skin on this, which is 12,000 different shaped pieces of, 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 of weathered steel. I mean, it really kind of looks just like that drawing. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's to me a, a, pretty, a pretty remarkable progression and something that we're very proud of. And so, again, this idea then of the, of the facade turning in and becoming um, this play on the Brooklyn night sky, the rails turn in and become the, the lighting elements. Uh, it's about this kind of mostly like black and gray and dark and, um, you know, uh, industrial, urban uh, uh, interior, um, puncturing through as much as possible to have this kind of inside-outside relationship to the city when you're inside the building. Um, these are some of the renderings. I just remember them when I show you the finished drawings. So you know, here are the rails coming through, the VOMs uh, pop through in, in this way, and then the concessions are sort of these minimalist steel boxes that come out of the dark gray walls and float um, wherever we could. We, again, it's just always these sort of simple material elements that pop in, and, and we, we push the practice court down below so that you could be both on the street and watch them practice or in one of the bars and watch them practice. This is the main sort of entry coming in where you see the scoreboard. And, uh, and then you know, you've always got different restaurants or walkways that are constantly looking back and forth as you're moving through the building. And then these other spots um, you know, where, uh, where, there, where there's this sort of punches of color and other clubs that actually come right into the bowl. And what we, again, this idea of all the seats being black and you know when we were speaking with um, with Bruce and with Jay and saying like, looks, we love sports because it's like theater, right? You know, it's with an unscripted ending though, and so we want the court to really pop, and we want the the whole arena to feel almost like a black box. And then the idea that as the each one of the metal panels folds in for a sort of one foot by five foot slot, and then we put all the lighting inside of the metal panels that just bounces off the folded piece 
of steel, and so you start to get this kind of idea of a, of a glowing object uh, in the city. So, you know, how to build it then? Um, because, you know, we had a delta of how to deliver this, and no one knew, had any idea. And if we hadn't been as involved in, with shop architects and shop construction and Hunt and ASI, the facade manufacturer, we all, we, uh, shop construction actually joint ventured on the project with the, with the facade manufacturer. We were working for both AECOM and Bruce Ratner, and we were all working together for Hunt. I mean, it was one of the most unbelievable contractual um, arrangements possible. And, but everyone sort of said, let's just, let's, let's pull up our sleeves and let's see what we can do. We broke it apart. We actually had dynamic models that were feeding directly into the, um, the material and quantity takeoffs and costing it. So we were pulling and pushing the, 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 the whole facade and literally watching the money move at the bottom end. And it was, it was incredible. And we did thousands of permutations and were able to sort of get it to where we could hit our number but not lose any of the art, if you will. Um, and then how this got built was a sort of panelized system. So all of these were obviously custom cut. There was a sort of armature and then this is the backer wall. These were the first mock-ups down in Florida for the, the water testing. And they would all be assembled uh, in a factory and then delivered to the site and put on the building. So there were, nine, there were 12,000 of these panels there were 921 different uh, mega panels, and you know, all modeled in Katia, almost all by Columbia graduates. Um, uh, the unfolded pattern of the 12,000 pieces. Um, we produced all the shop drawings, all done by shop construction, how the nesting, how it got put together. Um, we helped design a factory um, where the panels would hang, and they would go through 15 wet dry cycles a day uh, for four months to give it 10 years of patina on day one. And, um, and then every single panel, the, here are the rails as they were getting done. Here you can see them in their dry cycle. Um, it was all set up for exactly what could, the, all the sizes were optimized to what could be fit on trucks, how many minimal picks you needed, trying to eliminate the specialized equipment on the site. Um, here you can see them being loaded. Um, we tagged every single part and then wrote our own iPhone app that you could go up to any panel during any part of the process, scan it, a three-dimensional model of the building came up, you understood exactly where it was, where it, would, where it would go, where it would be installed, how it would be delivered, where it was in the process of getting weathered. And what was fantastic, it was this transparency. And I think often contractors don't want too much transparency, but the more transparent we were, the more we got of the architecture. And so therefore, anyone from, from Bruce Ratner to you know, the guy with, a, with a, a wrench could scan any panel and knew exactly where we were at any time. And it gave us the confidence to keep moving ahead. So this is the kind of things that would pop up. You would know where it was in the process based on the colors. Um, and there was this constant feedback model where we were learning as we were going and we were pushing it back into the, into the system and literally changing parts of the design as things were being produced and being built. We um, took the steel and cloud scanned it so because we had a, a head start. And the fascinating thing was we were able to align the, the digital model of the whole building to how it was actually being built in the, in the field. And we found that up to 15% of, um, of the anchor plates were in the wrong spot. And so by identifying it early, we were able to move every one of them and get them in place so that when the mega panels came, we knew that they fit. And so, I mean, it was literally probably saved three months of the project. So here you can see the panels going on. Here they are as they're being delivered and lifted. And uh, it's sort of on a rainy day. So I'll tell a little secret. Um, you see how there's a different finish here? That's because the first set of panels that they sent out, they wrapped, they wrapped them to think that they would protect them. And then they sat, on, they sat in on the site for a long time until the building was ready for a few months. And that wrapping actually removed some of the finish that we had put on it. And so then they figured that it doesn't need to be wrapped. It's already rusted, it's already weathered, just leave it alone. So they finally figured it out. So we're still battling to get those uh, to get those replaced. We'll see, we'll see what happens. 
but um, that, that was probably the most frustrating thing on the project for us. You can see the facade. And then the Oculus with this idea of the kind of large billboard that was facing inward, not out to the neighborhood. It was something that kind of created a dynamic energy as you walked onto the site. This whole canopy was really the, one of the most complicated parts of the project. We fully modeled all of the steel. Um, we showed how every single part would go together, working hand in hand with the contractor. If we hadn't gotten into this level of detail, this absolutely gets value engineered and we lose these parts. Um, so you can see the different kind of prefabricated pieces and how they got put together. Um, we even did animation showing the pick sequences so that they knew how it would go together. Here are the guys, I mean, look at the scale of this stuff. Um, here it is as it was going, going uh, getting constructed. Um, I think this was called the calamari uh, element. Mm -hmm. here, here it is getting put together, the pieces going in, and then as it got finished. So, um, you know, we, we finished it. I, I told everyone who came to opening day not to lean on any walls because you would definitely get wet paint on your clothes. It was like down to the, down to the wire, uh, finishing it. Um, but then you can really start to see how this really kind of huge building fits in in a very different way. And it was, it was what we wanted. We, we even put super reflective kind of like tacky 70s office park glass on that part because we wanted it to sort of reflect the sky. And there was this vision of these sort of two giant, you know, sort of steel snakes. And then in the middle, like puffy white clouds, like a Magritte painting and this sort of interaction between the two. And it, it somehow strangely works. Um, I, think, I think our client was horrified when they realized how shiny it, it actually was. But they, I think they've grown to love it. Um, this is where one of the towers is going to go in the future. So there's bike parking. Um, you know, they, they called it Carmageddon that, because we didn't put a single parking spot in and we just said, New Yorkers will take the train. And it's been fantastic. There has not been the kind of traffic jams. People do take the train and, um, and it's, it's, it's really working. Here you can see the lights as they bounce off the folded metal parts. Here you go as you're looking up. And then a typical night when, uh, when there's a game or a, a concert. Um, and you can see the inside of, the, of the, the Oculus. Coming in the main entry, where you can see the scoreboard and the, the bowl. Here are the concourses, uh, where the rails come in and fold up and sort of, you know, give you, maximize the height and sort of the dynamic motion as you move around. Um, some of the bars. Uh, and then the all black bowl. And when it's a game. And the way that really sort of just floats and pops in there, it's got this amazing herringbone floor. It's very dark. It's very rich. Um, they were doing tests on the black uniforms, on the players, under the lighting to just see how it would work with television. But the whole thing was really a fascinating process. Um, these are my two favorite quotes um, from it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this was after the very first day. <laughs> um, I'm sure James Dolan really hated that one, right? So, by the way, the Dolan spent a billion dollars and didn't even get a new facade. They only got their interior done. So, um, I, you know, I will say I got a little bit in trouble. I, I am a born and raised New Yorker, and uh, I am a sports fan. And um, I, the very first interview when we were when we were introduced as the architects, they said, I think it was the Times, said like, "Why are you taking this project?" I, well, I love sports and I love architecture, and it's New York. It's my hometown. Like, why? Why wouldn't I take, why wouldn't we take a shot on this? And they said, um, well, what teams do you root for? And I said, uh, I don't root for any team that rhymes with the word pet. And um, at which point I got punched in the arm by my client who owned the Nets. And I've, <laughs> I've learned to, love, to, to adore the Nets as well. And, um, uh, and when, but I will say that when, uh, when the Knicks played the Nets in that first game, Absolutely, my heart was rooting, rooting for the Nets to beat them, and, uh, it, and they did. Um, this is the sort of VIP entry area um, as you come in for the suite levels. These are some of the, the bars and clubs that sort of insert themselves into the bowl. This is the, uh, the famed vault lounge, so um, that's Jay-Z's uh, suite in there. There's a playpen for Blue Ivy uh, over there. And um, this is sort of his champagne and branded stuff. Amazing, amazing man to work with. Really brilliant, really forward thinking. 
um, and, and incredibly kind. Um, and then your, your sort of typical night at Barclays. So the last part that I'm gonna just talk about is now the towers that are gonna go around it. So um, uh, the, the thing that's tricky about the towers is twofold. One, in order to not go through the typical Euler process, the, 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 the zoning process in New York, they um, did a deal with the state where they were prescribed design guidelines. And as long as you followed the guidelines, you didn't have to go for approvals for every one of the 16 towers that are going to eventually be built here. It's, uh, six million square feet of housing is going on the site. And um, so the, the guidelines were done by the master planner, which is Frank Geary, and that's what we are following. And it's, it's tough. He's very smart. I learned something very good. He designed guidelines that only allow a Frank Geary building to look good inside those guidelines. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it's, and, and the other part of it is there's a huge affordable housing component to this project. So the budgets are are very, very tight. So it's, it's a tough one. And one that, again, we were really concerned about doing. And, but at the end of the day, what was very interesting was that Bruce, again, had an incredible vision. And he hired two separate teams. One team to design the building, the first building, completely in a conventional method. And one team to see if we could make these as modular construction, so that they would be built in a factory and stack. And I think the tallest modular building in the world was done in 1968 in London, and I think it's about 18 stories. And this, um, these build, the first building is gonna be 32 stories, the second one's 26, and the third one is 54. And um, so we've spent two years, so Shop was the only, uh, Shop and Shop Construction were the only uh, consultants on both teams. So different engineers, different everything, and we went in full parallel to each other and literally bid the two against each other. And I'm happy to say that the modular, the modular has won. And we broke ground in December, and we are going to build the three tallest modularly constructed buildings in the world. They're going to be built in a union factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So it's bringing manufacturing back to Brooklyn, and it's really rethinking how you could begin to make something like this. And the cost savings to us, the most important thing is that this actually makes affordable housing. There's a possibility to make affordable housing affordable. Now, the trick is, um, and this is something that I, I, we're still working out, but I think that what everyone is thinking is that modular means like inexpensive, like mobile homes or pre, you know, prefab. It's not, it's just the method of making it. And so what we're really, this is going and now our office has you know, more modular kind of construction uh, buildings that we're doing both as design build and as designers. And what I'm really excited about is to show that you could do super high-end modularly as the same way that you could do affordable housing in a modular method. It's like, you know, just because the Model T was the first thing on an assembly line doesn't mean that you don't make Mercedes in the same technique. So, um, you know, these are, the, these are the first three towers, the rest of the site that's going to get built. Here's where the arena is. We just had to use, you know, we tried to break up the massing as much as we could. Um, it's a kind of really interesting system on the way in which the information is made, how the mods are done, the 35 different types of these steel boxes that get produced. Um, these are the drawings. So basically, you build a foundation, you build brace frame walls up with it, and you stack these steel boxes with the mate line connections, and you connect them together, and you just keep going. One of the problems is the building is so light, you have a lot of uh, reinforcement for, for overturn. But you know, here's how the boxes get made with the, the steel mods, um, prefabricated kitchens and bathrooms dropped in. But absolutely everything gets done, including the facade, goes on the mod in the factory. And as there are, we've developed um, uh, a system that self-seals the facade so that there's no scaffolding and there's no work that's done on the outside whatsoever. So the boxes go, they self-seal, and you just keep stacking them up all the way. Um, here you can see the one piece and the different ones inside the building. You know, what it looks like at the ground floor. Here are some of the current models. You know, the, uh, the organization and where the bathrooms go. One of the fascinating things is that, um, you know, everything is done. The floors are in, the walls are painted, the lights are done, the switch plates are on, and it comes uh, sealed, shrink-wrapped. And actually, um, about... Uh, 
I think more than 80% of the connections for the MEP stuff are actually done from panels in the hallway. So it's all designed that everything comes to the hallway, you open a panel, you connect the parts from one mod to the next, you close it up, no workers even go inside the apartment until it's done. Then they rip off the, the, the seal like a brand new car and you move in. Um, you know, and they're just very standard, but you know, this is affordable housing. And we believe that it's gonna knock um, at least 20% off the cost of construction. I mean, this is an industry that if you do half a percent, it radically changes the way that the model works. And so to do 20%, we believe this is gonna just really uh, get, get housing moving again uh, in New York. So, you know, in conclusion, how in a decade we went from PS1 to this to this has been um, an incredible whirlwind. Um, I think that nothing prepared us better for what we've accomplished than this school. And, and the kinds of things that we learned here and the way in which we've challenged ourselves on a, on a daily basis. You know, um, I heard recently, I won't name names, but I heard recently a professor from, from this school gave a lecture at Cooper Union and said, uh, I'm really happy to be here at Cooper Union, one of the two best design schools in, uh, in, in the United States, along with SciArc. And I want you guys to know that there's no question in my mind that the best design school in the United States is here on Morningside Heights. I think it's an amazing time to be a young architect. I think that all of the sort of technology, the kind of paradigm shift, this thinking about, about expanding what architects do is what giving us our, grabbing these territories back and giving us a chance to really have an impact on the way in which uh, we live and occupy the city. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, whoa, wow, okay. <laughs> now I want to talk to you about beginnings because it's the beginning of the semester and we are all beginning projects, right? And I think it, it was a really, the most interesting moment of your lecture was when a hand sketch appeared in relation to a beginning because if, if anyone's at the forefront of digital practice, it's you guys. So I want to, I want to get a sense of where drawing versus, you know, drawing by hand versus drawing in the computer how that how that works, right? Sure. How you how you see <coughs> um, that relationship? Sure. the The process is it absolutely we draw by hand all the time. Um, you know, I would say it's it's a lot more about um, like the diagram and what the relationships are, what the context is. I mean, I think the way that we like to think about our design ideas is that there's a kind of internal logic that the building that we want the building to sort of have and the way it's going to work and evolve that comes into play against the kind of external forces of the context, right? And it's this kind of rub between the two and the way in which it's getting fabricated that emerges through this iterative process that brings you to the final sort of forms or shapes. So you've got to be able to draw it. Um, you've got to be able to model it. You've got to be able to fabricate it in the shop, you know, and make it. And if you can do all three, it's sort of, we call it the triangle offense. It's like if you could do all three, it's probably a good idea. If it fails at any one of those things, we throw it away and start with something else. But absolutely, sketching, drawing, up on the wall, it's just like school. It's pinups. Constant pinups is the way that it works. And, um, and that sort of iterative, inclusive process is, is, is sort of the way in which we do the work. No, you can do it. The it's question was, are there still <laughs> modes of thinking that cannot be transferred to the computer and the answer is? No, you can do it. You can, it's just how you think about it and how you assemble it. And I mean, I think that there are issues of speed and efficiency. I mean, sometimes I go a little bit bananas in the office when I say like, 
can we get three versions of this? And I get three full BIM models of it. And I'm like, you know, you could have just done a little sketch and we would have gotten it, but, but you can do it. On the beginning? No. Hand sketch first. But, it's, but then it quickly translates. Right. Yeah, no, there's a hand sketch is always first. Sure. Yes. <laughs> oh no, it had a lot of competition. Um, you know, again, I think uh, in in all of our work, we try to use that sort of natural raw material. So there was never an idea of it being a kind of painted finish. Um, we didn't think stainless steel was right. We didn't think stone was right. So metal seemed to be right. And, um, you know, I think we would have loved it if it could have been bronze, you know, at $150 million. So um, it was what was sort of the kind of richest, most beautiful material that had the kind of grittiness that we thought could work. And that we, we as, as the weathered steel emerged, we kind of liked the sort of super machine sensual shape with this kind of very raw gritty material and I think that I think that the juxtaposition works well so we're we're okay with it I mean it's definitely one of the most controversial things about the about the project you know but um, I think people are growing to love love that part too I don't know if it was intentional or not to have actually um, avoided the subject of controversy except in your title but, or until right now, but I was wondering if you could just address um, what it's been like to be part of such a controversial project, especially since um, it's been so, remained so unchanged since the initial conception. Um, you mean the, what's been unchanged is the master plan of the whole project as a whole or our building in particular? Uh, your building in particular. Okay. Well, I, I mean, quite frankly, the controversy predated us. And by the time we got involved, I mean, you know, the battle lines were drawn and the 34 lawsuits were filed. And, you know, we came into the process late. And, we, you know, we really, like I said, we really questioned ourselves if this was the right thing to do. You know, I also want to make it very clear. We called Frank Geary and said we would not take it unless we had his permission, um, which he gave. Um, you know, but it was... At the end of the day, by the time we got involved, I was of the belief that this building was going to get built. And so we, I think as a partnership, really came together and said, well, if it's going to get built, let's try and make it the best building we possibly can for, for, for our city. And, um, you know, we, we, we knew it was controversial. And, and I mean, and then quite frankly, I mean, like, you know, it would have been a lot easier to do something a little bit less, you know, progressive and and the weathered steel and everything, you know, but we said, forget it, we got to go for it. We have to go for it as much as we can. And um, the reaction has made us incredibly proud. I mean, I, you know, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me. I was against this, I protested it, I go to four games a week, you know, they're like totally into it now. And, and people like we did Brian Lair show on, on, you know, on NPR and the call in, the people who called in were like, I, I, I'm proud. I, I was against this all the way through. I live three blocks away. I, now I'm incredibly pow proud and in watching what's happened happened in Brooklyn and how it's really, I think, invigorated parts of the neighborhood. Um, so um, it was wild. It was scary, um, and I feel like we I feel like we we got there and and we're very proud of it too. Hi, I had a question about, um, I, I think it's interesting partially because um, uh, you, had, you started out with five principles, right? And uh, you know, you grew and grew and grew. And I'm wondering if you could comment on kind of the relationship or different structures, organizational structures within your firm, not only with shop and shop construction, but kind of ways in which technology or various different things have changed the way you operate, you know, either within design or construction. Because it's clear that the kind of iPhone app tagging thing is just like a hint of a larger indication of what kind of, I guess, visibility or kind of design process you see. So, yeah, again, kind of how do you, is, has the way you design within as a team changed as a result of certain processes? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously we're dealing, you know, and again, there's, there's many projects that we can't share because of non-disclosure agreements and everything else. I mean, 
I'm probably already going to get in a little bit of trouble today. But the, the, the kinds of projects that we're working on now are getting very large and very complex. And it needs to be a more and more inclusive process. And so I think that there's always, um, I don't want to call it a battle, but you, know, you need to tend to managing that kind of complexity and that many people in there so that it doesn't become you know, designed by committee, if you will. And so by making that effort and keeping, keeping getting, you know, continuing to get incredibly bright, young, talented people in and keeping this very open forum and open debate and this kind of iterative process and having amazing partners who have come and joined us, I think has only strengthened uh, our practice. Um, but it takes, um, you, you have to work at it at all the time. It's never, it's never, it's never just a natural thing and there's no, I don't believe really in the, you know, the kind of genius moment of the little sketch and then, oh, let's turn that into a big model. So it's, it's, it's constantly working at those two things. Um, but, but in general, it's kind of the same as when we started in a lot of ways. So um, uh, I really appreciate everyone. I know like six on six probably should have started by now. And um, I, I, I hate to keep you from your, um, from your Friday afternoon cocktails. I do appreciate you guys coming on a Friday night and appreciate the school um, um, uh, changing it for me. Um, but I did realize it's a really bad idea to give a lecture at six o'clock on a Friday at the end of the week. So I'm about to pass out and I'm done for the night. Thank you very much.